Hello and welcome to this lecture on the impacts of food production on the environment and health. So here's a little quote from the United Nations Millennium Ecosystem Report um, published I believe it was 2012, but I'd have to double check the date. So humans have changed ecosystems more rapidly and extensively in the past 50 years than in any comparable period of time in human history. So pretty tremendous. I don't want to say damning, but um, pretty tremendous how much we've affected our, for the world in which we live in such a short period of time. Obviously, humans have always affected the world in which they've lived, um, but never so tremendously and so sort of gravely in such a short period of time. So in this lecture, we're going to focus on land agriculture. Um, I highly encourage you to do some research into aqua farming, aquaponics, um, but really looking at fishing, fishery systems. Aquaponics and aqua farming sometimes is looking at growing land plants in just nutrient rich water. Um, so really look at the state of our oceans, look at the state of our seas, look at the state of our fresh waters, look at the health of the animal populations in the oceans, look at the health of the ocean ecosystems. We won't get into it too much really at all in this lecture, um, but I highly encourage you to explore that because it's sort of like the world we don't see, but we are having a sort of gross and very negligible um, impact, not negligible, our behavior is we're acting negligibly, um, but we're having a pretty tremendous uh, impact on oceans. So here we're going to focus on land agriculture. Um, so conventional conventional agriculture is kind of looking at the industrial mode of food production. And again, this way of farming basically evolved out of the Second World War. So we're talking not even 100 years that we've been farming this way. Uh, conventional agriculture, or you'll hear me call it industrial agriculture, is much more reliant on fuel inputs and chemical inputs rather than kind of, again, looking at the ecosystem as its own natural cycle. And how could we just insert ourselves in that cycle so that the cycle is naturally recycling itself and we're just part of it. Instead, we've sort of inserted ourselves, inserted our own sort of straight line from A to B without really thinking about that recycling aspect. Um, conventional agriculture is often focused on monocropping, which is farming just one single crop over um, hundreds of that, hundreds to thousands of acres, um, rather than diversifying the crops over that area. Uh, we could also talk about like mono animal agriculture as well, because oftentimes, again, if you explore this concept of concentrated animal feeding operation, or just Google CAFO, um, you'll see how we, sort of concentrate one single type of animal in a relatively small area of land, relative to the animals anyway, small area of land. Um, and what we do, you can think about this uh, as humans too, you know, think about riding the New York City subway or something, being crammed in a, a tight space with all these people. One person gets sick, it's really easy to spread that disease across all the people in the subway car. Um, so same thing goes with plants and animals. If we're just farming the same plant over thousands of acres or just farming the same animal in a really confined area, one animal gets sick, one plant gets ill, catches a disease, they're all very likely to catch that disease. On the flip side, if we could spread that all out, if we could insert some biodiversity amongst these crops, amongst these animals, put other animals in there, put other crops in there, spread it out, um, we wouldn't see the same rate of disease spreading. So kind of some thoughts about how could we do this differently? How could we do this better? Um, with these kind of, with, with this kind of definition of industrial agriculture or conventional agriculture, some of the things we see are, again, degradation of ecosystems, exacerbation of poverty, uh, basically undermining human ability to continue to produce food in the future. So not thinking long term, thinking about now. Um, but how could we change that perspective 
say, okay, I'm going to do this thing now so that people can continue to be doing this thing 100 years from now. Uh, we're seeing an increase in water scarcity. I don't even have to tell you about that. Just Google news on water scarcity. It's all over the place, right? Um, contributing to climate change and climate instability. So what we're going to do in this lecture is basically go through maybe a handful of impacts that industrial agriculture has on the environment at large. And again, this is really just an introduction to this concept. So I really encourage you to especially explore um, the impact of fishing on ocean ecosystems. I'll put a few resources up for you um, to help you begin to explore that. Um, but really, uh, this is just kind of the tip of the iceberg basically in this lecture. So greenhouse gas emissions. We know that um, global food systems account for approximately one third of all climate change related greenhouse gas emissions. Um, again, globally, livestock, pro livestock production for meat and dairy accounts for about 18% of all climate change related greenhouse gases. Um, in developed countries, the agriculture sector contributes 15 to 30% of greenhouse gases. So, um, in more developing countries, we might see like industries contributing more to greenhouse gas, gas emissions. But in developed countries, um, agriculture is a greater contributor because uh, we don't usually see such massive industries in developed countries, like textile manufacturing industries. We see more agricultural industry. Um, and again, looking at just the agricultural sector within the ag sector the majority of greenhouse gases come from livestock operations we know hopefully we know <laughs> hopefully you know greenhouse gases in the atmosphere contribute to basically changing climatic patterns so unpredictable rains dry spells um, variable weather patterns and then kind of circling this back to agriculture all this can have negative impact on crop yields, so how productive the farm is, which would impact the food available, which would impact human health. And again, that's kind of a narrow, still kind of narrow, just thinking about human health, but consider the entire environment there too. Obviously not so good if we're having dry spells or periods of endless rain. Um, and then we know that with climate change, we're, we see, like especially in this current era of climate change with warming temperatures, we're seeing increased incidence of infectious diseases, um, worsened air pollution, which is leading to worsened chronic respiratory and cardiovascular diseases. Um, just a little schematic from, mm, I don't know, I think this was UC Davis, but uh, I'd have to double check, but one of the UC schools. So again, looking at where do greenhouse gas, gas emissions come from, and you can see this is on a global level. Um, you can see roughly 20% coming from agriculture. Um, <clears throat> and this data is coming from 2014, 2013. On my previous slide, that data was a little bit older. So this is, again, roughly the same, um, looking on the global scale, roughly similar numbers there, but Anyway, that's a fifth of total greenhouse gas emissions coming from uh, agriculture. And then here we're looking at greenhouse gas emissions, kind of breaking that out per uh, specific food production. So you'll see on the y-axis, basically we have greenhouse gas emissions. And on the x-axis, we have um, kilogram of food consumed. So again, meat and dairy, we see more overall emissions. And then interesting looking at post farm gate emissions. So after the farm, after the food is produced and harvested, there's still greenhouse gas emissions. That's primarily coming from processing the food, transporting the food, the retail operation, cooking the food and then disposing of the food. So by and large, we see animal and dairy being the largest, larger contributors to greenhouse gas emissions, um, kind of varying amounts of post-farm emissions. 
And then as we move down, this is where we start to get into the vegetables and um, some fruits, but not even listed on this, this particular diagram. Um, but you'll notice seemingly that the post farm gate emissions too are also less, although proportionately um, maybe more, right? But anyway, just kind of an interesting schematic to look at what, what sectors of agriculture are contributing more to greenhouse gas emissions. So then another piece would be energy consumption. So where do we, what, what is the energy supply for the food system? So food production, farming, processing, packaging, distributing, transportation. These are the most energy intensive stages of food production of the food system. And these stages rely on fossil fuels for energy. We know that fossil fuel extraction, um, production, combustion, and consumption uh, contributes to air and water pollution. And we know that this pollution increases risk for asthma, bronchitis, cardiovascular disease, um, and cardiovascular mortalities, as well as cognitive decline and low birth weight. Um, and this is primarily for those people, again, who, who are exposed to this. So sure, us, we, the end consumer, are not often exposed to these things, but the people who have to work in fossil fuel extraction um, or in the combustion or consumption of fossil fuels to produce energy, um, these are the people who are exposed to these health risks. So. Where, where sort of the justice in the food system then if the end consumer can be fine and consume the food, but in the, in the production to get the food to the end consumer or harming hundreds or thousands of other people. Um, again, just a little schematic looking at energy use um, across a few different sectors. So, agriculture, and this is comparing obviously 1997 to 2002. Um, and just kind of an interesting trend is that in most of these aspects of the food system, energy use has gone up. Um, if you want to read this whole report uh, from the USDA Economic Research Service, <clears throat> It is a little bit interesting because in some sectors, we're slowing the rate of energy use, which is good, that's a positive thing. So we're starting to be aware of our impact and we're starting to try to make changes. And obviously, hopefully you guys have seen too, we're in a lot of sectors, we're trending towards uh, more renewable energy sources. So wind power, solar power, hydropower. Um, so all of these things would ultimately lead to um, less energy use or more efficient energy use, basically. Um, but you can see by and large, um, with the exception of the wholesale and the retail operations, um, all aspects of the food production system uh, have increased their energy use over at least in this five year time gap. Um, and that makes sense too, because of we're producing more food overall, but still worth exploring how can we be more energy efficient in our food production pathways. Then energy um, consumption, so still on this same notion. Uh, in 2007, the US food system used almost 16% of the nation's, of the country's entire energy budget. Um, and again, kind of from that last chart between 97 and 2002, over 80% of the increase in annual US energy consumption was related to food. So in that chart, we looked at on that last page, um, in that five year time gap, of course, energy consumption in the United States increased, but 80% of that increase in energy consumption came from food related industries. And then of course, as the population grows and we have higher per capita, um, expenses on foods, there's going to be a greater reliance on energy using technologies um, and food related energy consumption. So just being aware of kind of what's coming down the hatch, how can we create alternative energy systems? How can we make those really efficient so that our total impact can be less? It's kind of like a planning sort of. 
All right, so greenhouse gas emissions, energy use, synthetic fertilizers. So nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, that's NPK. Any of you gardeners out there probably know that already. Um, but these are kind of like dubbed to be the most important minerals in fertilizers. So these three minerals are commonly mined to produce fertilizers um, for crops. But these are non-renewable resources. Um, since the 60s, synthetic fertilizer production have caused um, increase in nitrogen and phosphorus flows in terrestrial ecosystems. Uh, I didn't put a slide in here, but um, that's that process of eutrophication to where we input, we wind up because of the fertilization, the synthetic fertilization put on farmland, we see this immense runoff of these particular nutrients because they've been pumped into the land synthetically uh, at such high rates to try to grow specific crops. But then those excess minerals, particularly nitrogen and phosphorus um, to lesser extent potassium, run off and get into waterways. And that's where we see algal blooms because we get all of these nutrients in there that then cause specific types of algae to bloom and become really abundant. Um, but then after that, we actually see die off and we see decreased oxygen availability in those waterways. So, you know, in one case, we might say, oh, that's good. Those plants in the water are doing really well, but really the total impact on the ecosystem is very detrimental. So you can look up eutrophication, um, look up algal blooms. Again, those of us here in the Southern Tier or in the Finger Lakes, hopefully have been pretty familiar with a lot of lake closures these past few summers, past several summers due to algal blooms. So that it's happening. Um, it's not just sort of made up stuff. We see it happening. Um, so there's that, so the eutrophication of freshwater systems, but then there's also an understanding that these are non-renewable resources. So if we just continue to mine, um, specifically phosphorus and potassium, we will take all that's there. There will be an end point. There'll be a point in which we can't mine them anymore. Um, and so if that's the case, and if we haven't changed our food production pathways, and then suddenly we run out of the input, well, there'd be a problem in terms of food supply would be pretty tremendous food shortages. Water, and again, I highly encourage you, I can't stress this enough, I highly encourage you to look up the impact of fisheries and ocean ecosystems. Um, this particular slide and the next subsequent slides are just focusing on land food production, but please explore what's going on in the oceans. So water, um, of course we use water to irrigate crops, that accounts for about one third, 33% of total water use in the United States. Uh, and irrigation for crops is the largest use of fresh water in the United States, <laughs> in the US. Um, <clears throat> of course, animal agriculture is one of the most water intensive sectors. Um, certain types of nut and seed production are also really water intensive. So it's not just animal agriculture. But again, it sort of begs the question, can we do better? Can we look at how we're at the current state of these production systems and can we improve them, right, for the health of the end user, but more probably more importantly for the health of every animal, human or otherwise, involved in the production pathway? Um, just kind of an interesting graph looking at where our water is going, where we're pulling it, why we're pulling it and what we're using it for. So at, without question, the largest use of water globally is for agriculture. Obviously industries use some, municipalities, and then reservoirs, this is interesting. I don't know if I might not have included the asterisk here for the reservoirs, but <clears throat> oh yeah, it's there. Evaporation from artificial lakes. So really interesting too that we see water loss from these vast reservoirs um, that otherwise wouldn't exist and where otherwise we wouldn't actually see that evaporation. So that's kind of really fascinating. I thought that was fascinating. But again, kind of, kind of the obvious looking at uh, globally, um, the majority of water use is in agriculture. And then kind of per crop. Um, so alfalfa 
and pasture, right? So these would be animal related um, water intensives. Right? So making sure that we are we can grow that crop to feed that animal um, or to keep the animal on pasture. Rice, pretty water intensive. Interestingly, sugar beets, which are only used for sugar. This, is, this isn't like eating beets. This is actually sugar beets are used for sugar to add sugar into all of our random foods that we eat. So that's a really interesting one too. We've talked a lot about sugar over these past several weeks um, and decreased consumption of total added sugar. Uh, so that would, if we did do that, that might pull this entire um, sort of crop out, which is a pretty water intensive crop. Um, you'll see almonds and pistachios are fairly water intensive crops. <clears throat> Subtropical kind of makes sense because of the climate. Um, cotton also really interesting and then you'll see kind of as you go down the list this is where we get more of our commonly consumed vegetables grains uh, and again I don't think fruit not too many fruits made it onto this particular onto this particular graph again here's your link if you wanted to read more from this article um, I wonder if fruits may so then social justice this is a really big this is a really big component of the food system. Um, so migrant and seasonal farm workers in the United States, they provide essential services for producing, harvesting, transporting crops. Um, and these are without question among the most economically disadvantaged people in our society. So kind of across the board, 23% of farm workers farm working families have total family income levels below the poverty level. Um, agricultural workers, and again, we've kind of looked at this little bit by little bit, but kind of through pesticide and fertilizer exposure, um, but these, work, these people are at greater risk for cancers, birth defects, reproductive disorders, um, neurodevelopmental disorders, not only in the farm worker, but also in the offspring. So exposure to pesticides, increases um, risk for reduced gestation time, decreased performance on tests um, of mental development uh, termination, increased risk of attention deficit disorders. And then looking at slaughterhouse workers, um, kind of different from crop workers, people who work in slaughterhouses are this list doesn't even get to sort of the the mental psychological impact of slaughtering slaughtering and then butchering thousands hundreds of thousand animals a day in one work day go to work kill a hundred thousand animals go home come back tomorrow do the same thing so physical injury is a really big one in slaughterhouse production and again i won't get into it so much here in this lecture but just investigate this. There's a lot of information out there. Um, it's it's pretty brutal. It's pretty disgusting from my perspective. Um, that's why I don't really want to get into it too much here, but it's very, I think, very important that we're aware of what's actually happening because we do consume a lot of meat, um, at least nationally, we consume a lot of meat. Um, and there's a really big disconnect between meat production and meat consumption. Right? We just go to the store, pick up a container of raw meat, and we take it home, we cook it, we eat it. But we never think about how did that meat get here, how was the animal affected, and how were people affected along the way. Again, that, you know, we could also get into a larger discussion on speciesism here, but like how were all of the animals affected, human or otherwise, in this production pathway. So just due to the sheer sort of load a number of animals that come through a slaughterhouse on a given workday, um, and there's not really breaks for these people, and they're literally butchering and cutting apart cows or pigs or chickens, especially cows and pigs. These are huge animals, so that's a huge amount of work on one person to go through that many animals. Um, and often it's so, the assembly line is so specialized, so the one person that's just the same aspect of the animal on every single animal. So there's just one repetitive motion or one or a couple of repetitive actions over and over and over again. So physical injury is huge. 
also respiratory disorders because mm, hopefully you can imagine slaughterhouses aren't the cleanest places the animals coming into these are not healthy animals um, oftentimes these animals have many bacterial or viral infections and that can spread to the worker in the slaughterhouse um, and kind of going along with that first point exposure to antibiotic resistant bacteria so um, there's a lot there we again we the end user rarely think about the impact along the entire food production pathway so again this whole concept of, of environmental nutrition starts to open our eyes to oh you know the apple didn't just grow out of that bin in Wegmans right that apple came from somewhere else or that cut of sirloin steak came from a cow how did it get here? Who is affected? How is the cow affected? You know, how is the health of this entire system going? And is this something I want to be a part of? Or do I want to sort of step out and try to make it better? And then these next two slides will look at two concepts, food insecurity and food deserts. So food insecurity is defined as the state of being without reliable access to a sufficient quantity of affordable and nutritious foods. Um, you can kind of follow this flowchart on the right, but food insecurity um, leads to poor eating behaviors, poor overall diet. Um, that can lead to issues with mental and physical health. That can lead to increased healthcare expenditures and decreased employability. Um, and that can lead to decreased total household income um, and increased trade offs in spending. So it's sort of a, a pretty vicious cycle. Um, and again, something we don't think about too much until it's kind of right in front of us um, and then a food desert is an area that's like pretty much devoid of fresh fruit vegetables and other healthy whole foods food deserts are often found in impoverished areas and then uh shoot i forget the year on this chart um but i would guess sort of somewhere in the early 2000s, so maybe between 2002, 2010. Um, but you can start to see kind of areas where um, food deserts are the most common, right? But interesting too, just to see, all right, well, two and a half to 5% of the population with food deserts, that covers a lot of territory here. We're talking about a lot of areas where two and a half to 5% of the population um, does not live within a mile of a grocery store and or doesn't have a car to get there. <clears throat> and I found this really interesting diagram just on the internet, but comparing what $29 would buy you at a regular grocery store compared to a convenience store. So just sort of an interesting visual there. But then also I thought it was really interesting that this convenience store actually had these foods um, because a lot of times a lot of convenience stores don't even have this, right? This isn't bad to be able to get a banana. I don't know if this is tuna fish, eggs, peanut butter, pasta sauce, pasta. Um, obviously not um, a ton of fresh fruits and vegetables. The only thing really is the banana, not even frozen vegetables. Um, so obviously not great compared to the grocery store. Uh, and then a lot more expensive. So this is sort of a food desert may have a convenience store, but it would not have an actual grocery store. So um, as of 2010, we know that Americans spend about not even 10% of their disposable income on food and that people who are in poverty actually spend a higher percentage of their income on food. Um, we know that especially again over the past 50 to 60, 70 years, um, subsidies for specific crops and crop insurance programs, specifically around corn, soy, and wheat, um, as well as dairy and animal industries, have created a food market where energy dense, nutrient poor, so these empty calorie foods are cheaper and more readily available at the grocery stores or at the convenience stores. So it's sort of making this issue of food insecurity and food deserts even worse because at the governmental level, we're subsidizing, we're giving money to production of crops that ultimately end up as junk food. 
So check your ingredients list on any of the junk food you like to eat. I would almost guarantee you that you would find at least either corn, soy, or wheat in that food product. Or some derivative of corn, soy, or wheat. Whether it's high fructose corn syrup, or it's soy lecithin, um, or it's gluten maybe. So part of why we have so many of those specific foods is because the government gives money to to farmers or agricultural companies to grow those crops. But ultimately those crops just become junk food and they're very, very cheap to buy. Um, food insecurity in the US is higher than it is globally, which is really interesting. Being a quote unquote developed country, you'd think maybe we could have developed out of such um, inequality in food access. Uh, more than 1 million children are hungry on a regular basis. In 2010, 17.2 million households were food insecure, and 23.5 million people in the U.S. were living in food deserts across the country. Again, these statistics are coming from a few years ago, so it would be interesting to kind of see what, if there are more recent statistics. <laughs> um, and then one of the last pieces is looking at farm debt and consolidation. So again, kind of since post-World War II, agriculture has become a much more industrialized practice. Small farms have been increasingly pushed out of agriculture for larger, more industrialized farm operations. And then power in food and agricultural industries, as well as pharmaceutical industries, have become, has become really concentrated amongst just a handful of corporations. So again, something else to explore is like, how many corporations actually control the food system, the agricultural system, including seed production and the pharmaceutical industry. Like Bayer, for example, look at Bayer. Who owns Bayer? Where does Bayer have their hands? It's really interesting once you start to see these connections between companies who have a hand in, a very large hand, in not only seed production, fertilizer production, pesticide production, um, as well as pharmaceutical production. So starting to kind of draw these um, connections and asking questions like, why is it that way? Uh, should it be that way? Should we develop it differently? Um, and unfortunately with this farm consolidation, many farmers have had to turn away from environmentally friendly and small scale farming operations um, just because they, they can't afford to keep producing that way um, because these larger companies basically control um, industrial, control agriculture across the boards, but really control industrial agriculture. Um, so this sort of transition from small scale farming operations to industrialized ag has been a major contributing factor to biodiversity loss, increased water and air pollution, um, overuse of pharmaceuticals, and animal and worker mishandling, so mistreatment of animal um, and farm worker. Again, just kind of an interesting sort of infographic of sorts from the National Farmers Union from 2016. So um, for every food dollar that a consumer spends, only about 17 cents actually goes back to the farmer. Um, the other roughly 80 cents goes to marketing, processing, wholesaling, distributing, and retailing. So it's kind of interesting if you look at some of this stuff. So like retail eggs, sell for three bucks, roughly more than a dollar goes back to the farmer. Or bacon, roughly four bucks for sale, the farmer doesn't even see a dollar of that. Um, and so this is kind of an interesting too to talk about do, where do we buy our food? Do we buy it at the grocery store? Or do we buy it directly from the farmer, him or herself? That's that's one aspect, one way to sort of work through this issue is buying from the farmer directly. And then this is looking at that, this um, concentration of power in the food system. So this is one example. And again, this is actually a really interesting report from um, Econexus. But Cargill is one of the major companies in the food production system. And so anything that's in green is something that Cargill controls or, or makes themselves. So Cargill um, makes soy, 
for feeding pigs. Um, Cargill makes seeds and Cargill makes fertilizers. Cargill also, by and large, controls um, cereal production and cattle and pig farming. Um, Cargill also has a big has a big um, hand in trading animal products, processing animal products, and retail operations. So by contracting, for example, to supply Kroger supermarkets. So kind of fascinating, once you start to see, this is an enormous system, this food system. And just a few companies basically control the entire system. So how can we change that, right? How can we improve that? Again, just kind of wrap up things we've talked about before. So diet and disease, the way we're eating contributes to not only obesity and human disease, but also contributes to air pollution, water pollution, antibiotic overuse, um, climate change, uh, and decreased animal, human, and environmental welfare. This is a really interesting schematic taken from one of the readings that's posted with this lecture. So we've kind of talked about a healthy eating plate, uh, but this is looking at healthy eating from the environmental perspective. So on this side, you'll see in blue it says environmental impact. So as we move up the chart, producing these types of foods has a greater impact on the environment. Producing these types of foods has a lesser impact on the environment. And then similarly, luckily <laughs> these charts align um, because on this side, recommended consumption of these foods is higher and recommended consumption of these foods is lower. So kind of an interesting way to think about food from the environmental nutrition perspective. And then lastly, just some thoughts on creating a healthier and sustainable food system. Education is huge. We can't change, we can't fix a problem if we don't know it exists. And again, companies like Cargill have done a really good job to keep the end consumer sort of blind to what's actually going on in the food production pathways. So education is sort of paramount. Uh, spreading this information so that more people know, so that more people can work to make a change. Um, and then impacting policy. So writing to senators, writing to our elected officials to say, hey, this isn't right, and I propose we do it differently. Um, food purchasing is also really powerful. How, where do we choose to spend our food dollars? Right? If every day everybody just spent one dollar less at the grocery store or spent one dollar more at the local farmer's market or directly from a to a food producer um, that starts to take money out of the system right so it's pretty pretty interesting to think about the impact that we can have actually on a very personal level right as one single unit we can actually make a very big change just by thinking about where we put our food dollars research of course to sort of highlight um, especially around new systems of agriculture or even just comparing organic agricultural systems to these industrialized ag systems. The Rodale Institute, um, I want to say in Virginia, <laughs> has actually done a lot of really great research into the um, long-term sustainability and productiveness of, of organic farming operations compared to industrial farming operations. And then interestingly, especially for those of us working in healthcare, this concept of healthcare without harm, right? So not only without harm to the patient, but without harm to the entire ecosystem. So for starters, let's look at hospitals, let's look at assisted living centers, let's look at schools. What food are we serving to people in these places? Why? Why? I tell you probably because it's the cheaper option, right? But why are we doing that? Because we know that these types of foods that we're serving are really unhealthy, not only for the people consuming them, but for, again, for the environment, the ecosystem at large. So how can we start to really shift healthcare so that we're actually thinking about the entire system of health and not just isolated components of health? So. I would say there's actually so much that we can do to make it a healthier, more sustainable food system. It's just a matter of doing it.